Gerald and Omar, welcome to our session. I would just like to confirm, I heard you saying, Gerald, that you're in Vienna and Omar, you are sitting in Dubai and I simply cannot get over the fact that in this day and age, we can have a call with visitors from all over the world and share knowledge that we don't have to have flown anywhere. If you can see in my background, I'm actually sitting just outside of Mpumalanga and Kruger Park. And this morning was driving with elephants. And now we're talking about this topic, which I'm passionate about, migration to the cloud. And today's session, we are really privileged to have Omer and Gerald, who come from a long background of helping clients migrate their business processes into the cloud. And before, Omer, we were talking, you know, in our previous lives, selling applications to people, the struggle was always to get uniformity across the organization. And today, uniformity is almost thrown out the door because it's a choice option that's forward to customers. They can have whatever they want as long as the underlying technology is there. And I think that in our preparation, I had a sneak peek at some of Omer's information that he's going to be sharing with us. And I'm really excited about that. I'm excited because again, we're in a position of power in the choice that we can make. That being said, there are a number of big deadlines which are looming and zooming, especially in our SAP friends worlds. And 2022 and 2025 are coming and are hot topics regarding technology and migrations into the HANA environment. And I'm hoping today's discussion is going to span a number of technologies. You are not going to be hearing a lot from me. I'm going to be handing over to Omer who is the Head of Strategic Partnerships for Middle East and Africa in the Microsoft environment. Walked a similar road to get to these points. You've come from selling and implementing SAP and now moving into Microsoft and looking at strategic alliances, which is the way everything gets done. So from my side, Omar, over to you. And then afterwards, I'll introduce you again, Gerald. Daniel, thank you very much and the entire Suze family for the warm welcome for this Tech Central Talks of today's chapter. So I would like to share my screen. And basically, as Daniel mentioned, we are going through unprecedented times, but technology is uh, becoming more and more important in our lives in, in different forms and different shapes. So today I would like to literally spend time on what's happening in the industry, what is cloud and what value it provides to us as individuals, as well as as companies. And also I will just touch base briefly upon a few digital transformation cases that we've recently embarked on a journey with our strategic customers. A few names, a few examples, how, how this works out for them, what are the benefits, what are the pain points they address. And then after the session, we can have a Q&A if the time permits. So without further ado, I would like to move over to our talk today. The average lifespan of a Fortune 500 company has gone from 70 years to 15 years. The question is why? And I think the business world is changing quickly around us. And technology is an enabler to these rapid changes. So... The clouds eventually, um, in part, enables this type of disruption in that it reduces or eliminates the previous barriers to entry. Imagine previously there was a need of a large capital expenditure spent on innovation to be part of this journey and innovation. Cloud also, in a way, democratizes the hardware, which makes lowered costs for computer, for storage, so pretty much the underlying infrastructure becoming commoditized. So the lifespan, going back to the lifespan question, the reason why Fortune 500 company has a significant amount of change because companies fail to innovate and adapt to customer demands. It is imperative that all organizations, including us as Microsoft, have the capabilities to innovate and to respond. The cloud is an enabler for us in that sense. So here are just some names I throwed out there who have been struggling with keeping up all the being innovators in the earlier days. Now, critical revolution is upon us, but in most ways, it's an invisible one. 
It's called the digital transformation. And I'm pretty sure you've heard this terminology in many ways. There is no denying that we are a mobile society. We have the instant access always on with networking capabilities that allow us to stream video, view content real time in a time and cost effective manner. This has obviously led to rich application development, giving consumers the ability to streamline how we communicate, learn, purchase, entertain, how we basically manage our lives. It's no different for the businesses as well. It's changing the way we interact with the customers, manage operations, control the costs, even how to build products, it has a huge influence. And we name this as we are in the midst of a computing paradigm with connected data, which is roughly as per 2019, if I'm not mistaken, there are 30 billion connected endpoints out there with 44 terabytes of data. I think where the value lies is what do we do with this type of information? How we purpose the information into fast and agile decision-making form. And I would like to just step back here and talk a little bit about the digital transformation, the invisible revolution, so to say. What we see out there in the market today is number one priority for CIOs is to digitize their business. The challenge is what to do once assets, products, people, facilities, customers are connected. And I would like to give a personal example here. I used to work, as, as Daniel mentioned in the beginning, for another software company who was more dominant in the enterprise resource planning and application space. I worked there over a decade and then moved over to Microsoft a few years back. And I can talk about Microsoft's digital transformation from a more holistic view, from a more holistic perspective, in the sense that it's not only the digital that changed, but it is also a fundamental cultural shift. When I first joined to Microsoft, it was more of a closed, know it all genius-oriented company, which values these cultures within the organization, which under the leadership of Satya Nadella turned into a learner's company with more open and growth mindset, which really brings and values the attributes around being more diverse, inclusive, and more open into what's going around and beyond Microsoft. And these eventually helped over the years for us to become the number one publisher on Android and iOS marketplace. Believe it or not, we have currently in our hyperscale public cloud on Azure, more than 50% of virtual machines running on Linux operating systems. We have strategic partnerships we built in the course of last few years with longtime rivals such as Salesforce.com, Oracle, and SAP. So just take a step back and consider the digital transformation from a more holistic approach. We believe our focus around these three ambitions will provide us the best opportunity to help our customers succeed during this invisible revolution that's going on. When technology becomes more powerful but less intrusive, it can fit into more parts of our world and solve even wider range of problems and also potentially unlock new opportunities that may be not even visible today. I would like to start into what's going on within the industry part with some historical context. At some certain points in history, advancements in technology fundamentally disrupt the economic landscape. For example, the first industrial revolution that happened in 18th century resulted from technological advancements, which supported eventually the iron production, as well as the commercialization of the steam power. I'll give you one US company example, the Boston Manufacturing Company, who was a textile manufacturer and still is, back then was the pioneer in utilizing the steam power in their manufacturing processes, which created significant amount of opportunity for them to have a better profit overhead with some machinery capabilities, which kept them survived 
in the midst of economical crisis with the high tariffs that's been implemented by US government, as well as tough competition coming out from the English textile makers. A century later, roughly, it was a second industrial revolution, which introduced systems like electrical power, gas, water, and telegraph lines. I'll give you an example of a Western Union telegraph company who was the first innovative company that used telegraph technology, leveraging it both for local and international commerce. Everything was going well for Western Union till another innovative approach has been undertaken, the telephone. The company was quite reluctant going into the telephone and they've never thought that it can be commercialized in a way that people can use it. And after they spent years unsuccessfully challenging the patent rights, they eventually left the telephone business completely in the late 19th century. On a side note, they are still an innovator, of course, but they completely changed their business model, moving into international money transfer nowadays as the primary business. More relevant to us probably is the third revolution, one you're probably most familiar with even, which is called the digital innovation. Although it started in the early 50s, probably the peak time of the digital revolution was a few years later in the 20th century, in the late 80s, early 90s, where the rise of digital computers and internet became more evident. Uh, and as these technologies became eventually widespread, it enabled information to be generated and shared faster and even more easily opening up new possibilities for economical, social, and also technological innovation. So obviously here as well, there have been winners and losers who were quite agile to adapt to these solutions and who were also pessimistic or skeptic about going into these disruptive technologies. I'll give an example very quickly from a film and camera business. The Eastman Kodak used to be regarded as a technological pioneer in the late 1980s. They were having roughly around 90% market share in the US around the film sales and camera sales. But they failed to adapt to digital photography, which was replacing film. And then also they failed to adapt to the smartphones, which was doubling as cameras. And they were reluctant and slow to adapt. And today, a few years back, Kodak was having recently emerged from bankruptcy protection. And they are looking into ways diversifying their route to market with new innovations beyond filming and cameras to, again, get back into its good old days. In contrast, the Kodak's competitor Fujifilm out of Japan found ways to successfully adapt and remain solidly profitable in the business by adapting to the digital photography and also diversifying their set of offerings out to their customers in a wide variety of innovative solutions. So why this context is relevant? For two reasons, probably. One, there is less and less time between these revolutions. Technological changes are happening more and more rapidly as we see out in the market. And the window of time that companies have to adapt is shrinking significantly. Two, we are facing another technological disruption today. So the principle of adapt or get left behind should be always top of mind. So let's have a look at what the next technological disruption looks like. The world is rapidly changing faster than at any point in the history. This is an indicator of the fourth industrial revolution that's emerging, which is largely driven by the rise of big data. The growth of the cloud in the sense of public cloud, in the sense of hyperscalability, and also a new era of intelligence capabilities. Well, thanks to the exponential proliferation of small, inexpensive chips, processors, we move from traditional computers to tablets, to phones, to sensors, to wearables. Machines are everywhere, basically, and constantly creating, collecting, making sense of data in our midst. Together, these technologies have the power to disrupt almost every industry, which is why the era is being rolled as the fourth industrial revolution. The breadth and depth of these changes is resulting in the transformation of the entire systems of production, manufacturing in that sense, management, and governance. 
Our ambition at Microsoft is to democratize the fourth industrial revolution by providing the building blocks to empower organizations, be it large and small. We believe an organization's data is a key strategic asset, which when combined with the cloud and the potential of intelligence capabilities, it provides the opportunity to automate, to innovate, and also to increase the speed of the business. Now, coming back to the time to adopt the disruptions, compared to the past, what is unique about the disruption, maybe the only thing unique about the disruption happening today is the rapid pace of change. This is a study what you see on the slide broadcasted in BBC, ran through by a Yale University professor, Richard Foster. They made an analysis basically that during past revolutions, firms had many years, even decades to adapt. They had this opportunity. Today, that's no longer the case. One indicator of just how fast the landscape is changing is the longevity of companies on the Standard & Poor's 500, which is an index of basically leading US companies. So roughly 100 years ago, if you look at 1920s, the average lifespan of a company listed on S&P 500 was 67 years. In 2010s, the average lifespan of a company went down to just 15 years. This demonstrates that it's becoming harder for companies to stay in the lead, no matter how well established they are, or even in business for very long. And experts like Richard Foster believe that we will see this trend continue. In his studies and predictions, he underlines that in the late 2020s, in our current decade, we will see that probably 75% of the entire 500 company that's leading at the moment will be replaced by other innovators. And only 25% of those will be in a position to stay in the index with the innovations they undertake. So the bottom line is today's organizations must adapt quickly to change using new technologies that fuel competitive advantage or they are at the risk of getting left behind. That's why it is quite imperative to make the most of big data, the cloud and intelligence capabilities, all of which help companies accelerate their speed of business through smart decision making and faster execution opportunities. With that, I would like to move over to a simple definition of cloud. I know everybody has an opinion around the cloud and cloud is a term used very liberally. So I feel it's good to start with an understanding of cloud, at least from our perspective. Let's use an analogy that we all can likely relate to, the evolution of dinner. Consider the evolution of dinner, a traditional staple to spend time with the family. Now, understand the different types and different options of dinner that we can have. In the old days, a long time ago, it was just solely farming, right? If you would look at from the efforts, from the time choice perspective, it has its own restrictions in terms of efficiency, depending on the year you have, you might have had potential lots of spoilage. It costed land, seed, fertilizer, water, tractor, storage, you name it. You had the full control on how to cook and grow. So you had the full control about the, uh, the, the whole stream. Then we've been introduced into groceries and groceries provided us eventually more options out there in terms of food and more diversity. Effort gone down drastically because then we could have chosen what we would like to cook and go to home and cook it. We still spent some time with cooking times and, and shopping eventually, but it created some sort of an efficiency. Then we've been introduced a few decades ago, the dine-out options, which became more and more popular in our current decade and in the past few decades, eventually, which is basically you go to a restaurant, you select the food, they provide you the food. You're only concerned about paying the bill and selecting the food. Everything is prepared for you. But then eventually what goes into your food, how it's being cooked, is entirely up to the restaurant or the people who provide you that dining out option. And very recently, within the last decade, we've seen new trends emerging, new types of options such as home delivery, which provides you the entire amount, the prorated amount of food to your doorstep with recipes 
so that you can cook your home meal basically in the way you want. And the question here is literally, how do these different options impact your family in terms of your traditional staple of dinner? If you look at it from the time angle, for instance, which options provide you more time or which options are more time consuming, but rather higher value to you or maybe not? So I think this is the main question, which also implies to the cloud uh, effort, time, choice, efficiency, cost, control, outcome, taste, all defines the way we would like to operate our dining option. And how does it equate to the cloud? Eventually, farm is pretty much like on-premises. What you may do today, the pool control, you can even hack your service if that brings any value. Then there is the groceries in the form of infrastructure as a service. And I must state here explicitly that cloud is with the grocery analogy, not just another co-location option, but rather providing more agility and services opportunities in that sense. Dining out is pretty much software as a service and then home delivery option with these new innovative solutions is pretty much the platform as a service provides the platform and everything for you to build your own unique customized solution. Key takeaway here, I think from my perspective is as an organization, you need the flexibility to make decisions across all these different spectrums based upon each unique solution, project, initiative, or a program that you would like to launch as part of your digital transformation solution. I don't mean that one of these propositions or offerings are higher in value than the other. It is really dependent on your organization, on your priorities as part of your digital transformation plan. To make the technology useful, we need to help our customers think beyond stereotypes of their industry and imagine the possibilities. This is how we look at it at Microsoft, at the core of all these cloud propositioning. Just imagine what if the business leaders had integrated access to intelligence across each line of business within the company, sales, marketing, product development, facilities management, executive leadership, IT, Imagine all had real-time access to customer feedback, warranty data, inventory management, interconnected across the business, improving the speed to market, ability to react proactive, and eventually gaining buy-in quickly across decision makers. So that also provides cost savings to the business. And also, I would like to underline here the power of knowledge giving your own customers an enhanced engagement opportunity across products, services, whereby adding value there for a potential, maybe revenue stream to the business. Just letting someone know practically that their appliance or generator or vehicle requires maintenance in advance, or that temperature of the soil is optimal for planting for the farmers has significant amount of incremental business value. And if businesses are not looking simply for ways to create customer loyalty through product innovation, enriched engagement models using scalable, secure, reliable technology, believe it or not, the competitors in the same industries are looking at it as we speak. So the time is now. And in the last few years, as Microsoft, we've seen an explosive growth in the use of public cloud. And I would like to underline the hyperscale public cloud in here to that extent. While most of the initial adoption was seen by startups and smaller organizations in the early 2013, 2014s, most of the new growth is coming from larger organizations adopting the public cloud. Now, you might ask what's causing cloud adoption at such a fierce rate. I have three fundamental business drivers at play here, all of which help explaining why the cloud is essential to capturing the value of data. First one is the speed. Needless to explain from my perspective with the cloud, server procurement and provisioning happens within minutes in the time of an eye blink instead of days or weeks, dramatically accelerating the pace of innovation there. Next one would be the scale where the cloud gives you an almost infinite set of computing resources. You can easily scale up, scale down your environments, depending on your demand, depending on your peak times. That means you really never have to worry about running out of capacity or about over provisioning at any time. You just use enough resources 
to support your needs, nothing more, nothing less. And cloud scale is also key to handling massive amounts of data in a cost-effective way, which brings us to the third advantage, which is economics. While an on-premise solution, let's say for a big data management and analytics is theoretically possible, investing in your own infrastructure often costs prohibitive and highly inefficient use of resources. You'll have to over-provision, you'll have to take into account peak times and everything else. And in contrast, you're paying only for what you use in the cloud. So there is a significant amount of cost implication, and there is also an additional benefit of changing from capital expenditure to operational expenditure, from CapEx to OpEx, which frees up capital from infrastructure investments so that it can be put to other users. It can be repurposed within organization where the IT becomes more incremental value added in that respect. When we look at the value chain of the cloud, value to business, as well as in the streams of value of, to business, as well as evolution to data center, I would like to point out here that the blue part that you see on the slide represents the hybrid and infrastructure as a service offerings. And virtualization has been amazing technology for the data center, enabling efficiencies, cost savings through increased density and decoupling workloads from the physical server hardware. But 10 years later, since the virtualization has been there, we are starting to run out of workloads to virtualize, leaving business wondering where IT should look for the next wave of business value. And probably the answer is that IT needs to look to where this purple part represents, where the business is investing. Looking higher up the stack, businesses are growing the investment in applications at a much faster pace and rate that company can spend on the infrastructure hardware. IT organizations need to get back into the game by looking into new innovations that support application services that drive the business forward. At Microsoft, the good news is that we are delivering applications and services of the around 200 plus services on Azure in this model and the model that I'm just pointing out here for several years already, which has developed a series of innovations from that experience. And I think this is where the companies need to focus to get the incremental value. Now, obviously there are some key requirements and considerations for choosing a cloud partner. Let's review some of those key cloud requirements very shortly. Privacy, you need to be confident that your privacy matters. Transparency and being leader in the transparency is also very important in the vendor you select. Is your vendor openly sharing with you what's important and what's going on, even including the attacks or vulnerabilities or any source of information, including the roadmap? Being verified is very important. What are the analysts outside saying about cloud, about the vendor, and how the vendor really reacts on those analysts? Being secure is the utmost importance and like privacy, this is a responsibility of the vendor, which is non-negotiable and it must be delivered better, not the same, but better than what you're able to provide to your organization today. Continuity, business continuity is very, very important. And regardless of the cloud delivery model I choose, there must be a continuity of service and seamless experiences. There must be continuity regardless of the technologies I use, for instance, if I use open source um, Linux environments in that sense. Then there are considerations for also cloud providers or specific cloud projects, which basically builds up the check mark, if you like. Performance is very important. Latency aspects is quite important, especially for business critical applications that are moving into the cloud. Data sovereignty is very, very important. In key industry verticals with local regulations, it needs to be fully compliant and governed. Security, as we said, the utmost of importance, but also security of the project is very important in that sense. And regulations, which has to do with data sovereignty, but looking at it from a more holistic approach, including country, geopolitical uh, implications as such. So these are all important considerations when looking into a vendor. One important aspect I would like to underline here is to look for an open and flexible cloud. 
we as Microsoft are more open there even before I shared the story with you of our cultural shift and involvement over the last few years. Non-Microsoft solutions are a key part of our strategy. More than 50% of our virtual machines in Azure are running on Linux today. We support solutions like Oracle's, IBM's, MySQL's, SAP HANA, as for HANA solutions. We are the number one publisher in the iOS and Android marketplace. We've even pre-built cloud single sign-on capabilities with organizations like Salesforce.com or Workday. And we have very strong Linux partners like SUSE, as highlighted here. This is a really good segue in when we were prepping here. One of the comments that we made and having Susie right in the middle there is a good indication, but just how prevalent the cloud is today. And, you know, it's almost the topic of migrating to cloud. For us, it's obvious that our customers are all going to be using the cloud. It's just which aspect of it. And I really love how this slide encapsulates the fact that that cloud is everywhere within the business discussion, no matter which exec you're chatting to, no matter which IT person you're chatting to, we are touching them in some way offering a cloud option. We really asked you specifically about your customer interactions. Folks on our attendees, we are going to get these slides because I think there's a wealth of information on them and we will share them with you. But I really wanted to ask specifically those customers who were considering migrating apps to the cloud business critical apps. And maybe if you could wrap up on that because we can then get yourself and Gerald to answer some more tough questions. Our customers are staying ahead by implementing few opportunities, few areas that digital transformation enable. Obviously, these are very similar as concepts like improving visibility and making accurate predictions or getting right products to right places, fixing problems proactively before they start. But these will be different in terms of use cases in which industry vertical it's going to be realized. If we are talking about manufacturing industry, it will be in the likes of remote monitoring, inventory management, predictive maintenance. And in the likes of a retail industry, it will be more of a demand forecasting, more of a supply chain optimization and creating operational efficiency. And in some other industries like financial services, maybe it might be mitigating the risk or creating a customer service improvement. So it shows itself in different areas. I'd like to give you one specific example before I wrap up with a project we've done recently, which is close to my heart, which is a project of my team. In a milestone project, I'm there replace its company-wide procurement system, which has been there since early 1990s. It was a system that evolved into a complex and mammoth piece of code that was difficult to refresh. Just as a pain point, the IT team at Daimler could only manage to release new features only a few times a year. And the purchasing process itself still included many manual paper-based steps that Daimler wished to digitize. That system was used, by the way, by 400,000 global suppliers of Daimler at, at the time. So we eventually transformed this system into a software as a service system running in Microsoft Azure, which involves the SAP's S4 HANA solution, the Intelligent Enterprise Solution, SAP Supplier Relationship Management on HANA, and the iCertis Contract Management Platform, which has been done operational within the course of three months, which costs also roughly 50% less than the previous system. So it was not a very easy decision for Daimler to take, for sure. But they were really experiencing significant amount of lack in the business, especially when it comes to a very large scale of representation with 400,000 global suppliers. Today, approximately roughly 4,500 Daimler employees out of those 10,000 plus employees are using the new procurement system on a daily basis. And each year, the system process supplier contracts procurement activities worth about 90 billion euros, which is roughly around 100, 110 billion US dollars worth of commercial transaction, which is Mm. roughly 60% of the company's turnover. So as Daimler grows, so will those numbers, as we mentioned. Another example is a Carlsberg Group, which is also a recent digital transformation project. 
Mm. Carlsberg, out of Denmark, but which is a global uh, brewer, was struggling to keep up with the competition in a big way within the new century. It's it's a company with history eventually, with historic evolution. And they embraced a digital strategy and a class first approach. And their intention was not only to move an existing commodity estate, a bunch of servers to the cloud, but becoming cloud native, the way they operate. If you remember, I mentioned the cultural shift and this is what Carlsberg is trying to implement in this. And they've been successful in that. So we've run the first step of the first horizon of the uh, digital transformation, which was moving their estate into the cloud. And now they are working on introducing new cloud native technologies, which integrates with the core data estate that resides in Carlsberg today. This is probably a good session where we can start our panel. You raised so many points, which I'm going to come back to, but I'd really like to introduce Gerald, who's going to be sitting on our panel as well. Gerald, we've invited you onto the panel because Omar and myself come from a partner background and you're a propeller head. You're a proper technical person. So I'm surprised there's a painting behind you and not a server farm, but, uh, Gerald, I want to ask you, are you actually seeing customers now in person and has your interaction increased or decreased over the last 12 weeks because of this COVID situation that we're going through? Yes, I'm seeing customers. I can't meet them, but it's changed because there is, in a way, it's become easier because all you have to do is set up a video conference, but everything is now very planned. What I really appreciated when going to events is, you know, you meet people at talk or when I could present somewhere, then people approach me after the conversation. So I really do hope things are opening up again. And, and then I'm hoping for an invitation to South Africa again. That would be, would be lovely. Anytime. <laughs> so uh, are you seeing a fast track of customers cloud migration due to the impact of COVID in your environment? or have people stood down and waiting to see how the cards are gonna lay? Yes, I'm seeing a fast track. I'm seeing a lot of movement towards cloud at the different layers that Omar mentioned. I, you know, people move virtual machines, especially containers is, is a new thing, but in particular, software as a service, platform as a service, are pretty sure not so much related to COVID. So I see the trend, I don't think COVID has triggered most of that, nor really delayed yeah. things on average. I mean, some move faster, some move slower due to that. But there, it's a strong trend that I think is COVID or, or not is not, is uninvitable. That's interesting. So if I interpret what you're saying is that this juggernaut is and we are moving into a hybrid environment or a cloud only born in the cloud, irrespective of where COVID is, customers are seeing the benefit of choice that they are getting through it. And what always reaches me is whether customers are migrating their core applications or if it's more of the periphery around that. And they're taking the periphery first because it's risk-free or they're taking their core applications because it is the risk to them. So they should migrate it while they're still fresh with energy. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I'm afraid it's another question where I don't have like this yes or no answer. You know, some I see are really about some departments like the QA guys for our, I mean, that's how we entered cloud and originally is the QA guys needed the elasticity and the scale. I said, okay, we use cloud. But at the same time, yeah. but certainly a very strong trend I'm seeing, and it was one of the examples that Omar used, is SAP. Uh, and, and that's where we have early on, I remember years and years ago, we had early conversations with SAP, with Microsoft, to make, to we actually created special instances or Microsoft created special instances on Azure for the really big SAP HANA databases. So mm. there, I think it's throughout and there is not one answer whether it's led by simpler things, obviously web service, et cetera, or I mean, what, what's more critical for your company than your SAP footprint, right? Um, and mm. 
Mm -hmm. And again, that's the elasticity that even for SAP, that makes a lot of difference. I agree with you. I can see a lot of people saying, before we get fatigued, let's look at our SAP instance and make sure that that is solid in the migration to cloud. Let me ask Omer a question. Omer, are you seeing decision makers change in the business on this migration? Is it sitting in IT or is it sitting more in the business area now? The uncertainty pandemic brought in triggered a more holistic approach from what I see in organizations. Mm -hmm. And I think the decision around systems are beyond operational concerns or just simple efforts of optimization. The opportunity for the organizations is to tap into those pain areas with a stronger willingness than before and plan altogether the steps to reach the tomorrow's vision as a whole company and business eventually becoming more and more on top of these decisions as we progress. If you look at specific industries post-pandemic like travel and leisure, we are working hand in hand with our customers in these industries who got highly impacted around the consequences of pandemic. And they are now looking into ways of becoming more innovative. And it's not just only cost-centric discussion. Mm -hmm. Obviously, cost reducing down the operational cost has a significant piece of it. But beyond that, they are looking into new ways to create new path to revenues and diversifying their offerings to the customers so that they can still stay relative to the business and can st still stay in the competition, if it makes sense. Excellent, thank you. I've got a question for you, Gerald, and mm -hmm. hold on to your hats. Maybe we should put Omer on silent so he can't hear, um, <laughs> which is which public cloud service provider do you recommend? Oh, that's, that's an easy one. I always recommend <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think there is a misconception. And that's, that's actually a good question that, that, that helps us clarify that. There is a misconception that public cloud is a commodity. Like, you know, in Austria, I can buy electricity from, I don't know how many different vendors, don't know how it's in South Africa. It still comes out of the same power plug and the, and the same power grid. And so when people think public cloud, they say, okay, they often think of what does this amount of CPU cores and memory, whatever cost per, per week, per day, per whatever unit. And that's one consideration, but, um, and, and Omar and me did not sync on that, just full disclosure. Um, but what Omar had in the presentation is, is actually, I think, the decisive factor is what are the additional services that you have? I mean, it's a virtual machine is, is, is good, nice, important or containers, but what are the, I think you mentioned 200 um, services that you can use. Um, what's the quality? What's the um, you know, availability? How close is the data center to you? Um, and so I, I firmly believe there is no universal answer, um, but the answer really lies into what do you need? Um, and that includes what is your relationship with the vendor and how does that vendor understand what you need? And actually, I would argue the ecosystem because, I mean, coming back to the SAP example, um, but, but many others, if you, bet, if you bet your business on, on SAP, you probably would want a public cloud service provider that has a very close relationship. You would want to have an operating system vendor that has a close relationship with both SAP and the public cloud service provider. So look at it by all means, look at the technical uh, data sheets, look at the price, um, have a negotiation if possible but ultimately look at the ecosystem and, and look at the softer factors. Uh, look at the understanding of your business um, that you feel that, that you see. Did you have a question from the audience, Carrie? What is new for clients when considering making any technology changes to mission critical systems that are not there last year? What's new, I think it's in, in, in how you make decisions. 
I think one key factor that I've seen is people are more willing or customers are more willing to actually experiment and play. The nice thing about public cloud is, I mean, you still have to pay something if you want to play, um, but you can, you can just put up an environment and a test environment that mimics your production environment and give that a run. Which mm-hmm. on premise, if you have to, you know, if you have to order all the, the hardware and the networking and then the installation, and maybe you need more AC or space in your server room, that actually takes a while and that commits you in terms of expenses. Whereas with public cloud, you could actually, and I'm seeing that, you can actually become more agile and you can mm-hmm. experiment. And as IT departments are generally becoming more agile things like Gartner calls it mode one, mode two, or Mm. DevOps, or however you label it, Mm. IT departments become more agile and using public cloud actually fully supports that. And so the recommendation I would actually make is give it a go. Have some of your technical people play with it, Mm. experiment, and then see, does this suit? Is this something you need to get more experience? Is this something Mm. you, you may want to get a partner because you don't feel confident you have that in-house? Mm-hmm. Do you want to maybe wait a little and move other things first? But it's an acceleration that I would argue. Yeah, and if I may, I definitely agree with Gerald on this. The technological capability of what hyperscale public cloud provides changes today almost on a daily basis. So in that sense, the year is almost like a decade for us. And not only the capacity, speed, and security are the areas that operationally outgrew over time, but also there are new integration parts every day, enabling critical systems to talk to non-critical systems, Mm. running sentimental analysis Mm. on our structured data from other vendors, media streams. So things are changing on a daily basis. I understand, and even we at Microsoft, for instance, as a hyperscale public cloud vendor, employees are struggling to keep up with those changes. But having said that, it is all moving towards to the benefit of the customer. And it is really an improving platform on a daily basis to make sure that new enhancements are added every single day as the technology evolves and more being democratized. I think, Omer, you just made the comment of the session, which is a year to us is almost like a decade. I find it crazy how long sometimes customers are taking to migrate their environments because I'm just looking at hours that will never come back. I think we've got time for one more question before we have a wrap, Kerry. Did you have another question from the audience? We do. I think it's directed towards Gerald as well. So wearing your CTO hat, do you believe in three or five or 10 years from now that nearly everything is going to run in the public cloud? Ooh, tough question. So not everything. There is never 100%. One reason the way we build our products we actually have to build them in-house because of security mm-hmm. certifications. And I bet the same, the same applies to others. So there is always special cases. Do I believe that the majority of what people have in your data centers or server rooms or under the desk right now is going to be running in clouds? Yes, absolutely. I've seen this with SUSE. We have moved more and more of what we are using ourselves. That's not the core competency of building our stuff. Mm. which has lots of requirements, including ones affected by security certifications. But we've Mm. been moving more and more to public cloud, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure service, the whole game of what is going to happen though is more and more stuff is going to run outside, outside of your data center and outside of Microsoft and whoever else's data centers. So, I see this big move into public clouds. I see some remaining on-prem for very specific reasons. Mm. But there is the whole trend of internet as a thing, not internet as a thing, IoT and an edge. So you will have things, applications, services running in cars, sensors, machine rooms everywhere. And by definition, 
those won't be running in your data center and those won't be running on Azure or everywhere else. So and two implications. One of that, the, we will hit very solid communications networks and, and connections, mm -hmm. protocols, APIs, how those many, 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 many devices and moving devices like cars, planes, etc., communicate and aggregate. And I would argue that actually impacts how we will develop software. Because mm -hmm. ideally, you want to use the same APIs, the same models, tools, to the extent possible, here and there. Otherwise, you need two completely paradigms, two completely mm -hmm. teams, and, and there is going to be a gap on how those communicate. So I'm not declaring public cloud a completely solved challenge, but I feel we have a good grip on that mm -hmm. as an industry. But how do you encompass this ever-growing IT mm -hmm. that affects households, if you desire mm -hmm. so? And essentially, all companies I've talked with recently, that is, I think, the next step. So mm -hmm. how do you go about the applications? Mm -hmm. And one of the answers I believe is going to be containers, but mm -hmm. much more. So, uh, Gerald, are you saying that the, well, maybe you shouldn't answer this, but the, the customers who are essentially born in the cloud, so companies that are starting up now have an unfair advantage over us who have been going for a couple of years because they don't have the legacy to deal with. So we can get our business application out of the cloud. We can get our CRM system out of the cloud. We can get our connections and our sales database out of the clouds, our management packs out of the clouds. Everything is there that we don't have to jump over the hurdles that we do in, in a more traditional type of business. Yeah, I would argue with software as a service, platform as a service in particular, it's become easier than ever before to bootstrap a company. Mm. Now, the challenge, is, the challenge is companies are more complex than ever before. And the customer requirements in terms of availability and response times and, and even just the UIs are becoming bigger. So it's one of those things in IT where we've become increasingly better at solving the problem. Mm. The problem, well, I shouldn't call customer expectations maybe a problem, but the, the expectations on what we deliver have grown and grown. We've got to wrap up now. So I'm going to start with Omer. If you could give a customer considering moving their applications, their business applications into the cloud, what two points of takeaway would you give to them as part of this Tech Central talk with Susie? One is cloud is all about choice. So as the vendors and they need to do their own due diligence very candidly, looking into the pros and cons of each public cloud vendor when it comes to vendor selection, but more holistically moving into a digital transformation or a fundamental shift starts with the culture. So culture is really important within the company to embrace this change. Thank you. Gerald? Just start doing it. Doesn't have to be everything at once, but give it a try. And part of that is Part of that is, and I would agree, is this culture of openness. And the culture that you hopefully have or can nurture within your organization, but also it's not a pure utility system. The relationship you have with your vendors and the relationship that the vendors have among each other, this ecosystem question, is absolutely key. And so that culture of openness, that culture of innovation, match that with yours, and I think you have a winning strategy. Thank you very much. I want to just summarize what I've understood today. And one year is almost like a decade for us. I think the technology is changing so quickly that you should be taking advantage of it. And that's one of the arguments from a cloud perspective is that the upgrades are happening with you or without you, which is brilliant. Hybrid is a reality. We've all spoken about a number of solutions. So a company is not painted into a corner today. There is great adoption because of speed, scale, and execution. And unfortunately, the pressure comes down to one heel being IT who need to be ahead of the game. It's a faster pace today than ever before. I really think the takeaway from Omer, the five pillars of choosing a partner, is a good a tick point for someone that's considering this migration. 
privacy, leadership, their innovation, security, and service that they're offering. We need to understand that. Cloud is more holistic than just opportunistic, which gives us, again, coming back to that theme of choice, which runs through it. We're not just looking at a cost reduction, but we're looking at increasing our innovation and new revenue streams. And then the questions answered is that not everything is going to be running in the cloud, but the people who are born in the cloud can bootstrap a lot easier than ever before. And the democratization of development environments means that a customer that is looking at their core environments and going onto a paid for cloud environment is going to be easier. It's going to get easier as it becomes more and more commonplace. And then we're ending with choice do your diligence because you can make a silly choice if it's your first choice, maybe change your culture and really start listening and learning from people. And then relationship with vendors is open and magic. Magic can happen if you allow that relationship to be open. We didn't even scratch the surface uh, on this topic. I think that there's so much that we could have gone through. But uh, having an hour of your time has really been a privilege for us. Thank you, Gerald and Omer, for giving us this time. Uh, folks who have attended, thank you for being here. If you have more questions for the Suzy team or the Microsoft team, Kerry will be getting them through to our panelists and they'll answer the questions for you. From my side, thank you very much. Thank you.